Hey there, all you lovely lilies of the valley. Welcome to Broadway by Ghostlight. I'm Mark Benani, and if you're like me, you absolutely love I Love Lucy. It has always been one of my favorite favorite TV shows of all time, and still to this day remains, I think, one of the funniest shows ever. And as a major musical theater nerd, one of my favorite episodes has to be the operetta. I am the good Prince Lance. I love to sing and dance a lot. With our beloved Schmigadoon sadly no more, I've been nostalgic for breaking down episodes. So I thought, why not break down one of the best episodes of one of the best TV shows of all time? Oh, that's a lovely idea! Oh, wonderful! By the way, I know many of you have reached out to me about Schmigadoon's cancellation, and I will definitely talk a little bit more about that at the end of this video, so make sure and stick around to the end for that. But without further ado, let's take a time machine back to the 1950s and explore the musical mayhem the Ricardos and Merches get up to in the operetta. The operetta was the fifth episode of the second season of the already smash hit TV show I Love Lucy, airing on October 13th, 1952. But the episode was actually filmed much earlier in the year during season one. Towards the end of filming the first season of the series, Lucy found out she was pregnant, or enciente as the show put it to please the censors, but she was due smack dab in the middle of production for season two. Back then, they would film an episode only about a month before it aired, so this was a major problem. To get a head start on the next season, after already filming 35 episodes for the first season, five additional episodes were filmed, including the operetta, but held back for the beginning of season two. The director of the episode was Mark Daniels, who had directed all of season one, including the fan-favorite episodes Pioneer Women and Lucy Does a TV Commercial. It's so tasty, too! It's just like candy! The operetta would be his final episode for the series, however, but it was his favorite one nonetheless, though he always said he regretted not filming it in color. The episode was written, as all the early episodes were, by the brilliant team of Jess Oppenheimer, Bob Carroll Jr., and Madeline Pugh. The episode begins in Lucy Ricardo's apartment where her club, the Wednesday Afternoon Fine Arts League's meeting, is coming to a close and the women are saying goodbye. But as soon as Lucy is alone, we can see that something is troubling our red-headed housewife. Lucy's best friend and landlady Ethel Mertz enters and Lucy spills the beans about her dilemma. The club has decided to put on an operetta, but Lucy, the club treasurer, knows that there is not enough money in the club's account to put on a big show like that. Apparently, Lucy was $10 short on her household account one week and borrowed from the club treasury to balance it, but things got out of control in typical Lucy fashion. That was only the beginning. From then on, I borrowed from the household account so that the treasury account would balance, and I borrowed from the treasury so the household account would balance, and on and on and back and forth like a tennis game, and somewhere along the line, I lost the ball. <laughs> what do you mean? Now there's no money in either account. As anyone who's put on a community theater knows, one of the biggest expenses is the rights to perform the show itself. So to save the $100 royalty fee, which would be over $1,000 adjusted for inflation today, Lucy decides she and Ethel will write the show themselves. We could save the royalty fee. Who is we? We is Ethel Romberg and Lucy Frimmel. That's who we is. <laughs> That's, of course, a nod to two of the biggest names in operetta, Sigmund Romberg and Rudolf Frimmel. Sigmund Romberg wrote shows like The Student Prince and The Desert Song, among many others, and Rudolf Frimmel wrote Rosemarie and The Vagabond King, among others. Lucy gets Ethel on board by promising her the leading lady role, and to save money on a leading man, Lucy offers up her celebrity spouse. Now, the next thing we have to do is get someone to sing the male lead for nothing. Who? Who else but John Charles Ricardo? <laughs> that is a reference to baritone John Charles Thomas, a well-known operetta leading man. The women then get to work writing the score. Well, 
actually, just Lucy gets to work. It seems like she has written at least the majority of the show herself, which is pretty impressive for someone as tone deaf as Lucy Ricardo. Ethel shows up and Lucy tries to weasel out of her promise to cast Ethel in the lead. Lucy tells her that she can play Camille, which initially excites Ethel, who no doubt is imagining something more along the lines of the Greta Garbo film Camille, but instead it's a snaggletooth old queen of the gypsies. The girls have a little sing-off to determine who will play the leading lady, and it goes about as well as you'd expect. Once that's settled, Lucy tells Ethel the outline of the plot, and I don't know if you guys remember the full plot of this show, besides what they actually perform, but it's bonkers. Well, anyway, they have the wedding, and then, like the gypsy predicted, tragedy strikes. On the way to the prince's castle, a band of highwaymen hit the prince on the head, kidnap you, and take you to their cave in the forest. Now, the reason the highwaymen kidnap the peasant girl is that the wicked witch has turned the leader into a frog. <laughs> yeah. The leader of the highwayman is, a, is the princess's brother who was separated from her when they were tadpoles. And that's just what we get to hear in this 18 scene musical. We also learn that Lucy has already rented the costumes and scenery and post-dated the check until after the show when, in theory, their account will be full from the musical's profits. In the next scene, we see Ricky rehearsing his part. There was actually a scene before this in the script, but was cut for time. It would have been a scene with Lucy asking Ricky to be in the show. He, naturally as he always does, would initially refuse. But as Lucy tries different means of persuasion, including smooching, pestering, and wheedling, Ricky hands her pre-prepared notes saying why each of those techniques won't work. When Lucy gives one of her signature cries, Ricky hands her another prepared note saying, I can't stand crying, I'll do it. Ricky then would have revealed that Fred had already asked Ricky to be in the show, and he thought they'd get a laugh out of it together, so he agreed. I think a fun little scene that I would have loved to have been included, but say la vie. So Ricky is rehearsing his part of Prince Lancelot, but not taking it as seriously as Lucy would like. That then leads to this great joke. None of that da-da-da stuff. Let's hear the words. They're good words. Let's hear them. Good words? <laughs> Lancelot. Dancelot. <laughs> Who wrote this operette, anyway? Who wrote it? Did you ever hear of Victor Herbert? Why, sure. Well, all right, then. Go ahead. <laughs> Victor Herbert is one of the greatest composers in American operetta history. Among his many shows are The Red Mill, Naughty Marietta, and Babes in Toyland, his most popular. Fred enters in a Greek outfit, sending the studio audience into hysterics, a well-loved gag on the show, and he and Lucy leave to deal with the costumes. Ricky and Ethel then commiserate over Lucy's lack of singing ability, and we get our first ever, I think, series name drop. Well, look, honey, I, I, you know, I, I love Lucy. And then Ethel reveals that she's already got a plan in motion where anytime Lucy opens her mouth to sing, the chorus women will join her, setting up one of the funniest moments in the show later on. It's now the big day. Sticking her head out of the curtain is the club president introducing the show, and it's honestly one of my favorite little bits ever. I can't come out in front of the curtain because I have my costume on. <laughs> that wonderful actress is Myra Marsh, and she's returning to the role of club president from the episode Lucy Writes a Play, where she introduces that show, too. The overture is called for, and from then on, we're in the world of the pleasant peasant. We open on a tableau of maidens in some unnamed picturesque country with painted backdrops, a very operetta-like opening. All the women in the ensemble are the club members we saw at the episode's opening, and they all sing a bit of the show's title song, The Pleasant Peasant Girls. Sad 
Sadly, all the actresses in this ensemble went uncredited, and shockingly, there is no online record of their identities. I mean, there has to be some file or record somewhere in the world of who these women were, but I could not find anything in my research, except for one of the women, but more on her in a bit. Up next is Fred Song, the good Squire Quinn. The rooms are lovely and full of space. There's running water in every place. Yes, there's lots of water if you can stay. The longing out for a rainy day. <laughs> I love this number, and I think it's so funny. And William Frawley delivers it perfectly. I'm especially obsessed with this rhyme here. So ends my story and I think that this'll be a good time to wet my whistle. Frawley was an old vaudevillian before his days as everyone's favorite grumpy landlord and introduced and helped popularize some old hits like My Melancholy Baby and Carolina in the Morning, which he would later perform on Isle of Lucy. Strolling with my girly when the dew is pearly, kinda early in the morning. But as the good Squire Quinn with his in on the out, I think he's perfect. In fact, you may have noticed my Quinn's in shirt I had specially made to be a near replica of the one from this episode, and I just love it. It's available in my merch shop if anyone happens to be interested. There'll be a link in the description, and the sales do help out this channel a great deal. Anyway, next we are introduced to our leading lady, Lily, played by Ethel. One of my favorite bits in the whole episode is the beginning of the song with Ethel pointing. It's a brilliant example of perfect comic timing. Another stanza I'm obsessed with is this one. When other girls go walking on their arms, they have a swell bow. But whenever I go walking, on my arm is just my elbow. And then, of course, she nails the end of her iconic number. A prince who has a plan for me. Tell him not to tell. Vivian Vance was certainly no stranger to the stage. Before Life as Lucy's right-hand gal, Miss Vance appeared on Broadway in several musicals, including the original casts of Music in the Air, Red Hot and Blue, Let's Face It, and Anything Goes, where she played Babe, and understudied the role of Reno Sweeney, played by Ethel Merman. Though, Miss Merman was legendary for never missing a performance. Oh, darn it. But if you think about it, Vivian Vance could do Reno Sweeney, but Ethel Merman couldn't do Lily of the Valley. Just saying. A big, stupid, muscle-headed moron! Next, the snaggletooth Camille, played by Lucy in all her comedic supernova glory, enters. Lucy introduces herself in the song Queen of the Gypsies. Now, I do want to acknowledge that the term gypsy and Lucy's outfit are racially insensitive, and I in no way condone it, and I hope that we can all just see it for what it is, for the time that it was made, and just sort of look beyond it. Uh, you know, that's when you deal with old musicals and old TV shows, you encounter this kind of thing a lot. Besides, the real comedy comes from Lucy finding out in real time that the chorus of women will be singing along, and that culminates in this epic vocal slide that I think starts a whole measure before the final chord. The Queen has a prediction for Lily and initially plans on singing it, but again is surprised by the new choral arrangement. I took the wind. <laughs> oh. 
when the women singing catches Lucy off guard, I laugh every single time, which has to be in the, I don't know, hundreds by now. Lucille Ball is the only one of the main cast to have never performed on Broadway before the run of I Love Lucy, much like her character on the show. Do remind me sometime to tell you about my experience in musical comedy. Come on, Ethel, let's get some coffee. Hey, just a minute. What was the name of the musical comedy? Oklahoma. Oklahoma? <laughs> Lucy, why don't you tell the truth? You know that you were never in Oklahoma. I was too. I spent two weeks in Tulsa once. <laughs> The legendary comedian would famously do one musical in the 1960s, however, called Wildcat. And I've got a breakdown of the whole drama, both on stage and off. There'll be a link to watch that at the end of this video. If you haven't seen it yet, definitely check that one out. Lucy tells the fair maiden her prediction that a prince is coming to ask for her hand in marriage, but warns that the marriage must never take place or it will mean unhappiness for everyone. Though literally seconds later, she's thrilled for the prince to arrive. We get one more great bit from our club president, and Ricky makes his grand entrance as the prince where he's greeted by the town and all sing The Troops of the King, a hilarious ode to ale. This song is a direct homage to the breakout hit song from Sigmund Rongberg's The Student Prince, which was called The Drinking Song. Everyone scatters and the prince introduces himself to Lily in the song The Good Prince Lancelot, which goes from him bragging about being with a bunch of women. I have an eye for a pretty face. I love the girls, but it's not this great. And then instantly launching into a love ballad with this basically stranger. All I want is you, Lily. Ah, early musicals. Desi Arnaz, besides of course being a real-life singer and band leader like his TV persona, had starred on Broadway as well in the musical Too Many Girls, written by none other than Richard Rodgers and Lorenz Hart in 1940. In fact, it was during the filming of the movie version of that musical, with Desi recreating his Broadway role, where he met his future wife and co-star Lucille Ball. Look, Lucy, this whole thing was my fault. I your fault. <laughs> yeah. It was something that I said that started this whole thing. What'd you say? I do. During the prince's song, he mentions several women, and these names are mostly all the names of sisters or other female relatives of the writers Jess Oppenheimer, Bob Carroll Jr., and Madeline Pugh, which makes sense because the latter two were the ones responsible for the hilarious lyrics for The Pleasant Peasant. Which brings me to the one person I haven't talked about yet, the band behind the music for the operetta itself. The music was provided by Elliot Daniel. Mr. Daniel would later write the music for I Love Lucy's other musical episode, Lucy Goes to Scotland, and he also famously wrote the lyrics to I Love Lucy's theme song, sung by Desi Arnaz in a later episode. I love Lucy and she loves me. Back in the show, we're about to have that ill-advised wedding, but it all comes to a halt with the entrance of one of the pleasant peasant girls informing Lucy of trouble backstage. What seems to be the trouble? <laughs> there are some men backstage who are taking away the costumes and the scenery. Apparently, the prop house decided to ignore the post dating on the check and tried to cash it anyway. I gave him a check! <laughs> Came back? 
I mentioned before that only one of the chorus women could be identified, and it's this wonderful performer. In fact, if you go back through the whole operetta in this episode, she gives such an amazing over-the-top performance. I love her. This is Betty Janes, and she was almost a household name. Miss Janes was a child opera prodigy and was under contract at MGM, where she was featured in several musical films, including Babes in Arms in 1939, opposite Judy Garland and Mickey Rooney. Miss Janes played Mickey's younger sister Molly and had a great number with Miss Garland. But Betsy and Judy may have been more closely linked in an alternate timeline. In one of the original outlines for The Wizard of Oz, Dorothy was going to sing in a jazzy style and have a friend and companion, the Princess of Oz, who was to have sung in an operatic style, and Miss Janes was slated to play that role. The whole part, of course, was obviously cut well before production began, but that would have been an interesting take on it, I guess. Our tastes are just the same except for just one thing. I like opera. I like swing. A couple of fun goofs occur during the melee of the men repossessing the sets and costumes. A few times you can see some of the women waiting in the wings to make their entrance and run on as if they've been being chased by the men. Three guesses who goofed. What did I do? <laughs> Not you. Lily gets carted off, and Lucy tries one more crack at her solo as the curtain falls on the Pleasant Peasant and the episode. The Pleasant Peasant would make two small comebacks in the series, though. During the season three episode redecorating the Mertz's apartment, Ethel is singing her song while getting ready for the Ricardos to come over. Out of Lily, out of the valley, out of the quiet, peaceful valley, over there. And later in season five, during the episode Lucy Goes to the Rodeo, while trying to think of something to perform at Fred's Lodge, Lucy suggests their old operetta. I know just exactly the kind of show that your Lodge brothers would like to see. So do I. Well, you can't do that kind of a show. <laughs> What's the matter with an operetta? Oh, an operetta. And yeah, I could say, Lily, the Wednesday Club. Lily, the Valley. Lily, the Valley. Lily, 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 Lily. The operetta holds a special place in the Arnez Ball household. A magazine interview from 1953 stated that the operetta was the first episode that little Lucy Arnez, the famous couple's first daughter, was allowed to stay up and watch live. Though I doubt Miss Arnez, a Broadway baby herself, would remember much from that night, seeing as she would have been about 14 months old at the time. How does the operetta stack up with the other I Love Lucy episodes for you? I would love to know what you guys think of The Pleasant Peasant. Also, being a Lucy fan, tell me what your favorite episodes are. I'm just obsessed with that show. I actually have a major fascination with fake musicals from movies and TV, and before I decided to just focus in on The Pleasant Peasant, I thought about making some sort of list video about fake musicals, and I made a list of about 40 or 50 that I could think of off the top of my head, and then I posted to Twitter asking people what their favorite fake musicals are, and it got well over a thousand responses. So my list has ballooned to say the least. What other fake musicals from movies or TV would you like me to cover in a future video? Maybe I'll do a top 10 or a ranking video? I don't know. We'll just see where the wind blows on that. But let me know your thoughts. Now, for you Schmigadoon fans, yes, tragically, the show was not renewed for season three by Apple TV+. Even more devastating was that all the scripts and all the songs were already written and ready to go. Ugh, kills me. I'm sure you are all as upset as I am. A few things you can do right now is use social media, tweet, post, whatever, using the hashtag Save Schmigadoon and let the people know they need to reverse this curse and renew season three. There is also a change.org petition started by the amazing Ryan James D, another Schmiga nerd. So please go sign that and share it with fellow fans, family members, anyone you can get to sign it.
I'll put a link to that petition directly in the description as well. I've reached out to Cinco Paul a few times and he is grateful for all the fan support and I will of course update you guys with any news that may come up on the Schmigadoon front, rest assured. A reminder that you can pick up this great Quinn's Inn shirt to show your in on the river out pride to all the masses, you know, everyone's gonna know what this is from, come on. There's also a bunch of great Schmigadoon inspired shirts, including a brand new one that I'm really excited about. There it is there, I've already gotten mine, it looks beautiful. Thank you so much to my patrons over on Patreon, as always. You guys are rock stars, and I appreciate each and every one of you, and all the people who have been part of the Patreon in the past as well. Thank you. I've got a big, exciting video coming I can't wait to get to work on, but until next time, this is Broadway by Ghostlight. I'm Mark Benani. Thanks for watching. Well, what a bunch of pleasant peasants you are. <laughs>